Okay, looking at the election, there's a lot of thoughts, questions, concerns with what's happening, and some people are saying the election's already over, we have a president-elect, some people are saying we need to wait and let the process play out, but in the midst of this, and all this drama and chaos, drama and chaos is not a new thing in presidential elections in America, but especially looking at a very tight race where there could be not totally unprecedented conclusion to this because the Supreme Court might rule and, and there's been one or two examples of that, but, but there's a really interesting example backing up to the 1800s in American history that might even give some context that what we're going through right now, not the first time Americans have been in a place like this. Yeah, it is not. If you look at the election of 1876, what you have in 1876 is election between Republicans and Democrats but at a time when the nation was extremely divided, polarized. Less than a decade before, there had been this extensive civil war, largely divided along racial issues. There were other issues, but the South was very strongly pro-slavery. They had been the pro-slavery Confederacy, and so there were still a lot of unreconstructed folks in the South who didn't like equality, didn't want equality, they opposed it. They didn't like the fact that blacks could now vote. And so a lot of things in that election really kind of came to a head over racial issues. Uh, as the election played out, it turned out that the two candidates, the Republican was Rutherford B. Hayes, the Democrat was Samuel Tilden, who was governor of New York. And by the way, New York, even though a northern state, was a very strongly pro-Democrat state, and they had supported slavery even in the Civil War. They just didn't want to break up the Union. So the Democrats in New York were still pro-slavery, and they didn't like the, the Reconstruction policies of equality. So Samuel Tilden was running as Democrat, and as it turns out, when the election's all over and done with, Samuel Tilden is the one who gets the majority of the popular vote. But they couldn't decide who won the electoral vote. As it turned out, it was the closest electoral vote margin in history. The closest electoral margin vote in history, Rutherford B. Hayes won by one electoral vote, but it was a long process. It was months, literally. So what happened is you had three... So first of all, understand, months means right now we're just a week, two. I mean, we're not that far from the election. People are going, it's over, or waiting the process. And like, this is not unprecedented that we might have to wait for literally months to find out who the actual winner of the That's election right. is. This is not a brand new thing. And it's okay that we wait to see the process play out because you want to make sure the rightful winner is actually the winner who becomes the president. But back up to Rutherford B. Hayes, this took several months. Several months. There was debate, uh, certainly between Democrats and Republicans, about what was valid, what wasn't valid, and their candidate's really the rightful winner. No, our candidate's the rightful winner, so it was very contentious. And, and so this actually ends up going to Congress to try to resolve this conflict since there wasn't a, an apparent winner from what they were seeing. Yeah, there were three states that were contested, Florida and Louisiana and South Carolina, all Southern states. The Democrats came up with a different vote total cast in those states than the Republicans did. And those were still states that had new Republican governors in them after, after Reconstruction. And, and so a great example uh, of what happened was, and by the way, this is the highest voter turnout of any election in history, 82%, any recorded election for percentages, highest percentage. But what happened in South Carolina, 101% of the population voted in South Carolina. Which is really impressive when you only have 100% of people, but 101, so that's, oh, that's good math. But the Democrats counted all 101% and the Republicans said, no, that, that, that's fraud. So that was a contested state. The same kind of stuff happened in Louisiana and in Florida. As a matter of fact, in the South, because blacks could vote as a result of, of the 15th Amendment passed in 1870, what happened was a lot of blacks were still illiterate because the laws in the Confederate South said that it is a capital offense to teach a black to read. So while blacks are learning and teaching themselves to read, they're not getting much help from, from a lot of the southern states and the Democrats there who didn't want blacks to read. They have ballots that are, that are printed with pictures on them. So if you can't read Democrat or Republican, what they had was a picture of Abraham Lincoln with the Republican, except the Democrats switched that around and put Abraham Lincoln's picture beside the Democrat vote. So a lot of free blacks who were voting for Abraham Lincoln actually were casting for Democrat votes, and the Republicans said, you can't count those ballots, those are illegal. And Democrats said, no, those ballots are fine. They voted for That's the Democrats. That's not really ballot tampering, though. I mean, just because we switched what party was where and the leader, like, 
No, that's fine. They still got to vote. And this is the kind of silly stuff. Like, again, today people are looking and thinking, wait, widespread voter fraud doesn't really happen. We will cover that in another video because this kind of stuff has been going on really since there have been elections. There were people that tried to cheat in elections. This is true in America. That's been the way it's been for a long time. Fortunately, there were enough honest people. This system was set up very well by the founding fathers to try to prevent where a lot of this voter fraud couldn't sway always the outcome of the election. So it was a very good system. But again, not a brand new thought. We're looking today and people are going, man, this is crazy, all the fraud. Or some people are saying it's not fraud and that's why it's going to court. We're going to let the courts weigh in. And when all the evidence is presented, then we'll be able to determine, was this actually fraud or did actually Trump just lose to Joe Biden? Well, that will be determined in the court. But up to this point, fraud certainly has been something happening in America. And so back at this election where people in South Carolina, Florida, Louisiana, they're tampering with ballots. They're intentionally trying to sway the outcome of the election. This is why, again, it goes to Congress and Congress now has to be the one to weigh Mm -hmm. in and figure out, well, who's going to be the leader of the nation? So in January of 1877, Congress passes a law to set up an electoral commission, an election commission. And they say we want 15 members on the commission. And what it's going to be is five members out of the Senate, five members out of the House, and five members of the Supreme Court. And those 15 will get together and they'll decide who won the election because Democrats are counting the the votes, Republicans are rejecting the illegal votes, and so can't come to a conclusion, can't agree who wins. Now, at that time, the House, the majority of the House were Democrats. So of the five members, there were three Democrats, two Republicans. The majority of the Senate was Republican, so there are three Republican senators, two Democrat senators. Now you're tied five to five. So there's five justices from the Supreme Court, and they chose two Republicans, two Democrats, and one Independent. So now the commission is seven Republicans, seven Democrats, and one Independent. The Democrats went to the Independent Justice and said, hey, how would you like to be the U.S. Senator from Illinois? He said, great, I'd love to do that. And so he accepted that position. They say, great, we've now got eight Democrats, seven Republicans, except he said, you know, the right thing for me to do is to recuse myself because I came on this as a neutral guy. So now he's off the commission and they got to have one more Supreme Court justice and all the other justices on the commission are all Republicans. So of the four remaining Republicans, they chose the least partisan Republican and put him on the commission. And so this thing goes on for weeks and weeks and weeks. And eventually they come to say, all right, let's do this. We'll give all the remaining electoral votes, which are 20, uh, out of the states. There were actually four states. There was one disputed electoral vote in Oregon, but that was definitely a union state. But they said, we'll we'll give all of those electoral votes to Rutherford B. Hayes. He can be president. But what you've got to do is take all federal troops out of the South. We want no more Reconstruction troops down there. And if the federal troops go out of the South, you have no protection for blacks. At that time, I I don't think they actually believed that would get as violent as it got after that. But that was the agreement, and it was months, literally, before they reached an agreement. The Supreme Court did not have a voice in that except to be on the commission. And when, when the troops were removed from the southern states, this is where you had some of those Jim Crow laws now being yeah. passed in the south. Very terrible laws in some of these states. And, and, and there's a lot of history behind that. There are a lot of places you can go to find out more about that. But it's interesting. Going back, looking at this presidential dispute, it actually goes to Congress. There's this commission that's put there. Supreme Court justices are on there, and they finally have a resolution. And it's, we'll give you the presidency as long as the southern states could do what they wanted to do. And that's actually part of a really sad legacy Mm -hmm. from some of these southern states in America with some of the very bad things that happened there. And actually, it goes back to this contested presidential election. So what we're looking at right now with this presidential election, we're praying that we don't have the same kind of sad and bad outcome that happened in 1876, 1877, with people being disenfranchised, with many black Mm -hmm. Americans in Southern states losing some of their freedoms and abilities and opportunities and rights. Obviously, we don't wanna see bad things happen in our nation, but the point is having contested elections, having a long drawn out process, having commissions and courts weigh in on this, it's actually not a brand new thing Mm -hmm. in American history. And so in the midst of all that's going on, just know, right? We want the process to take its place. We want to make sure that there wasn't fraud, there wasn't cheating, and then we want the rightful winner actually to be the president of the United States of America. One of the cool things we really enjoy doing is going back and looking at history because history does give us so many good examples to help us understand what we're dealing with now is not a brand new thing. As Solomon wrote in the Bible, there's nothing new under the sun. So even though we feel like nobody's ever dealt with this, the more we know history, the more we realize we're not in a brand new place in America, 
But this is where we would encourage people. We need to do a better job of knowing our history yeah. and then make sure that we are praying for the current yeah. situation. That's right. If you want to know more about this, you can go to wallbuilders.com. And we have a brand new book called The American Story, where we actually go through the journey in early America. And we learn a lot of the history, both the good, the bad, the ugly. And we see God's unquestioned providence intervention along the way in the story of America, helping America become the most stable, prosperous, free nation in the history of the world. But if you want to know more about specifically that election from 1876, American History in Black and White goes into a lot of those details outlining what happened, what happened after the process was done, Rutherford B. Hayes becomes president, a lot of the deconstruction, the positive things in the South that are removed, the Jim Crow laws come in. A lot of that history is tracked in American History in Black and White. And something that we really need to understand as Americans is our history. We want to know where do we come from so we can better direct where we're going in the future. And in the midst of all that we're talking about with knowing our history, learning the story, we want to make sure that we're praying for the outcome of what happens in America. We want right. to see justice prevail in America and we want to see peace in America once again.